that's what my unpredictable hair sounded like before Frizz Ease. Sound familiar? We'll stop the crunchiness and celebrate your curls with Frizz Ease Air Dry Waves. It gives you defined, touchable waves with soft, feather light movement. No heat required and no frizz. And that's the sound you'll hear and feel with your defined, touchable waves from Frizzies. Frizzies Air Dry Waves, only from John Frieda. Log Talk Radio. is your guide to an astounding future that lies ahead, one that will be here sooner than you think, and one that you have an important role to play in bringing about. At The World Transformed, we want to introduce you to what may be the greatest transformation of them all, the one that begins with considering and acting on the almost limitless possibilities that lie before us, and that ends somewhere beyond the reach of the human imagination. So, when does this amazing future begin? Well, today is the day. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-blogger, co-futurist, and co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I'm super fantastic. How are you, my friend? Doing great. Getting towards the end of a uh, work week, and that's that's a good thing. So <laughs> Always, a, always a, a good feeling. I, I uh, Before we bring out our guest, Stephen, I want to say something directly to you. Uh, mano e mano, as it were. Last week, we recorded a live show on your birthday, and I did not acknowledge it. So <laughs> I am well, chagrined you... and nonplussed and uh, other words to that effect that uh, that I have committed such a grave error in the you know broadcasting buddies' uh, annals here. So I want to go on the record well, you know, officially. We, we have done this on your birthday before as well, Phil. And, and, and we always make a big deal out of it. I make sure of yeah. that. You know, that it, it always comes up. So. <laughs> So you know, oh, yeah. I just want to say I pre- I belatedly, I pre- happy birthday! Yeah. I hope you, I hope you and uh, you and the family had a had a wonderful time. I'm not going to violate our rule about singing, but I do want to yeah. wish you. Uh, Please let's not do that again. <laughs> especially not with our guest on the show. She's, yeah, that's right. She's been subjected to enough of that. But uh, but a very happy birthday to you, and uh, uh, always uh, always a pleasure. Twenty nine again. It's amazing. Uh, you know, you, you you look like a man. Nearly twice that age. So. Uh, yeah, two decades older than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's bring out our guest because we're always thrilled to have PJ Manny with us. PJ joins us this evening in her uh, role as our empathy expert and our human and technology relationship advice expert. I think is kind of a new a new role we're giving you, uh, PJ. In addition to being, of course, our Hollywood correspondent and. Uh, yeah, you know, just general expert on on a lot of things generally. How how are you, PJ? Welcome to the show. I'm very well, guys. Thank you so much. I love being here. Well, we uh, we love having you. And you know, before we get into anything uh, deep about technology or astronomy or any of the rest of it, uh, what's happening in your in your life? Catch us up. Happening in my life. Well, the big news is that uh, my novel, which your listeners have been. <laughs> Probably the longest, uh, it's coming, it's coming in history, is finally being I won't being say published. how many years ago it was, but you did mention your novel in your first appearance on this program. It's it's depressing. I really don't want to even think about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've been waiting. We've been waiting very patiently. As oh, as well. th- bless your heart. Thank you. Uh, but it is coming out this, uh, most likely this May, 2015. And it's called, it is, name is now changed, it is called Revolution with the little brackets around the R, so uh, it could also look like Trademark Evolution. Uh, I have to say I wish I came up with that title. It's a fabulous title. Uh, my editor at 47 North Amazon came up with that title. Uh, he's the genius. 
So uh, we are very excited about this book. They are very excited about this book, and uh, I am very excited to be talking to you about it sometime next year. Well, we can't wait to have you on and officially talk about it. I've I've had the privilege of reading some of it up front, uh, perhaps an earlier version, so I, it, it, it may have changed since then, but uh, I will say this, it's awesome. It's a great story, and... Um, I'm looking forward to reading the uh, to reading the whole thing. I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the really interesting things that are going on around its publication that I won't mention. Uh, and uh, we're just very excited for you. Congratulations, PJ. Thank you so much. Can't wait. It's going to be great. Awesome stuff. All right. So uh, we we got a we got a huge show tonight, and I just wanted to start off by uh, addressing something that I saw in my news feed earlier today. And I haven't been able to track it down to a reliable source, but uh, I I got quick confirmation from the two of you that this is correct uh, prior to the show. So let's talk about this. Pluto is a planet once again. Is that right? Well, that's the gossip uh, on the street. (laughs) Yeah, I I can't find news to that effect. I I just did a Google search, and I don't see anyone saying that that's actually happened, but, but there's rumors to that effect. So perhaps it's happened and it's just not getting any big news coverage. I don't know. Um... I see this uh, small victory. Pluto's planetary status bears nostalgia. So maybe that's saying, oh, yeah, yeah, here we go. Yes, Pluto may just, in fact, be a planet after all. Okay, so two days ago, three days ago, apparently, uh, and this is on the red and black. Um, We're back to nine planets. All right, so let's discuss Pluto, a planet. Good thing, bad thing. Stephen. I, you know, it's a it's a good thing. I think uh, the argument, one of the arguments made against uh, making Pluto a planet again, was that if we make it a planet, then we're liable to end up with like 50 planets uh, revolving around the uh, the sun at some point, because there are other objects in the Kuiper Belt that are uh, are, are bound to be as you know big or you know or as you know um, as as Pluto, and, and so we end up with a uh, you know all all these planets. Well, I say the more the merrier. That's just fine with me. Uh, if, yeah. if it turns out that we have uh, a lot more than nine, uh, when it all when all is said and done, that, and I don't have a problem with that. We we obviously have a um, you know untold number of uh, exoplanets that get you know that are being discovered exponentially. It seems now. So uh, why not have a bunch around our sun as well? So I, I, it's just fine with me. All right, PJ, thoughts. Well, I think it has more to do with culture, honestly, than whether than than our self-imposed definitions. That's we like the idea of Pluto as a planet. Pluto is is this cute little runty underdog of a planet, and I think that it really appeals to children. I think it appeals to people who think, "Wow, one year on Pluto—that's a damn long time." Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I think I think it, there's there's a lot of emotional appeal about it, its existence, and you know even tied up with Disney's dog. Um, and I think we just want to want to believe it's a planet. So why not? Really, I mean, you know, the, a lot of these definitions. I won't say they're arbitrary, but the very fact that we're still arguing whether it's a planet means. Uh, choose yeah well to I, me, I, I have an idea for what a definition of a planet ought to be and see if, uh, oh, go. if you guys okay, are okay go, go are okay with this um i'd like to hear it how yes. about how about an object that has sufficient mass so that it is round it is no longer irregularly shaped because it's uh it has enough mass to make itself round and uh and it revolves around a star and, it, and it's orbiting as, a star as opposed, not as another, opposed to a, not another uh, planet oh, yeah yeah Exactly, which would make it a moon. So, um, you know, so it doesn't really matter how big it is or or whatever. It's just long as it's big enough to be a a round object. That works for yeah. me. What do y'all think? Um, I'm I'm good with that, I guess. But uh, uh, the the problem is then, well, then we don't have a like a memorizable set of planets, right? When <laughs> when we had eight, exactly. when when we had nine. That was like okay, well, you know, I can I can commit that to memory. What you're suggesting, Stephen, is we will potentially have dozens, I don't know, if not hundreds of planets in the solar system by the time we get done out, you know, through the Kuiper Belt and uh, uh, <laughs> the Oort cloud and so there, forth. There's, right? there's, there's, there's even one asteroid that's uh, that, by, by that definition. Um, 
Uh, but it's one between Mars and, uh, uh, is it, you know, is it it, um, yeah, that's the one. It, uh, yeah. it would be a planet by that def- yeah. definition, I believe. So, so, so we lose the whole, you know, my very educated mother's just service nine pizza pies thing, right? <laughs> Memorizing the planets or, you know, having the whole, uh, uh, like manageable number of planets. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I, I think that having like the solar system, Mercury through whatever you know, whatever the last one is, I won't, uh, I, won't I won't take a stand. Is is good uh, the, the having having that model and maybe cutting it off uh, north of where you said, Stephen. I think is probably uh, a, a good idea just from a standpoint of, um, uh, of of viability of these things as planets. But I don't have a. I, the problem with that is I don't have a better definition than the one you just gave. The one you just gave makes perfect sense, um, and it's 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 pretty hard to argue with. One of the things I like to, to add, PJ, to what you said. One of the things I like about uh, Pluto as a planet is that there are still people who can remember when it was discovered. Right? That's you know th- that's, that's this, right. Yeah, th- this this thing that happened in relatively modern times. There aren't many people who can remember that, but there are a few, and you know that's a that's a kind of a cool thing. And all the sentimental stuff you mentioned, I think those are all good reasons that we should never have deplaneted it in the first place. But then once it's out, bringing it back in <laughs> to me is worse almost than the, the than the initial mistake. I'm like, okay, well now we're just going to forever be bouncing back and forth on these things, and we're and we're never going to be able to keep it straight whether uh, whether something is a planet. What it reminds me of more than anything else, and this may or may not be meaningful to you, PJ, Stephen. I know this will hit home with you. It starts to remind me of the continuity in DC Comics. Okay, and if you know, if we're just going to be retconning planets, right? It, it's 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 all over. It's it's hopeless, and and when we you know we'll be saying, oh well, it was always not a planet, or uh, we we always defined it that way. Anyhow, um, I uh, you know, so you're basically thought on you're saying uh, a, a planet should have a revolution, but not an evolution. Is that what you're saying? Oh, very good. That's uh, yeah. that's exactly right. Well, I, I okay. would prefer that we have eight or nine. I would prefer that we have, a, you know, a, a small number that a, a kid can memorize the number of planets and build a model of the solar system. I think that that, <laughs> you know, there's something very uh, that, that appeals to the uh, astronomer hobbyist in me about that. But uh, we shall see. We'll, we'll see what happens if it if it stays a planet. If it gets if it gets changed back. If they decide to make a series of planets, all kinds of all kinds of possibilities out there. But that's not our main topic tonight. Um, I, I, I gave our show this evening just about as link bait worthy a title as I could think of. Um, is technology using us? And I'm pleased to say that I didn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't come up with that idea myself. As I've mentioned in the show notes over on Blog Talk Radio and on uh, WorldTransform.com, I actually picked up on this, Stephen. This was the uh, much discussed, actually briefly discussed, too late to talk about topic from last week, was this piece that you sent me from TechCrunch by uh, Christian Cantrell, um, talking about several interesting issues around technology, a very philosophical piece that uh, Cantrell has written here. But uh, one, one quote from this piece, he says, this is only one example of how technology has a tendency to self-propagate, to use humans as a vector to create copies and mutations and derivatives of itself to recursively generate demand for itself in order to not only ensure its own survival, but its constant and even exponential proliferation. The relationship between humans and technology is becoming increasingly enmeshed, and in some cases, even ambiguous. So uh, this, this very interesting idea that technology is in some sense using us to, to further its ends. Um, giving an unexpected answer, I guess, to Kevin Kelly's question, what does technology want, right? It's like, well, we might not even know, but we're just, uh, we're just cogs in that machine, apparently, to, to use a, a very tortured metaphor in, in, this, uh, in this instance. But uh, to, to, to look at Cantrell's piece just for a minute, it, it starts out with, he starts out with a very interesting uh, discussion about how self-driving cars are kind of the he says kind of the Ptolemaic model of the universe answer to achieving certain ends that we could actually have achieved through a good, honest public transportation system. Um, 
And I find that really interesting because as soon as I read that, I say, well, that's not an example then of uh, um, technology using us for its ends, or is it? Um, you know, is, is, is technology flattering us um, and appealing to, uh, in some cases, our, our maybe less responsible, less judicious natures and getting us to go down paths that we wouldn't have gone um, in order to push itself in the direction that it wants to go? Or is that maybe uh, anthropomorphizing technology too much? What do you think, e either of you? Um, well, initial th thoughts on this idea. I, I think the, in particular, his his public transportation versus automobile metaphor lacks history. I live in Los Angeles, which was the site of the final death knell of public transportation, or certainly efficient public transportation in the city of Los Angeles until the last couple of decades when we've finally installed trains. Uh, and even then, they're not efficient. They don't go where they need to go, et cetera. Um, what really happened, and what he completely ignores, is that the automotive industry was, a, in essence, a uh, conglomeration, a cartel of a variety of industries that really wanted to see automobiles take hold. And they bought up all the great transportation systems in cities and destroyed them. The red car was the final one. And, of course, we think of Los Angeles as the home of the automobile, given how, how uh, huge distances, vast landscapes that you have to traverse to get from one point to another. And they bought it, and a week later they shut it down. And when I mean they, the automobile companies and the oil companies bought up public transportation to put right. them out of business so the car companies could have the domain. Um, the very first freeway in America was built here in Pasadena. Um, where cars were driving all of 30 miles an hour. And let me tell you, driving that freeway right now, how nerve-wracking is it to go in and out of exits that are something like 12 feet long? Right, right. At 60 or 70. <laughs> um, but I, I look at that and say there, there are a whole bunch of false equivalencies that, he's, that, that he has in that essay. Um, however... I don't think that actually negates his, his point, which is there are other examples, I believe, of areas where the complexity of the world, and this is, the, this is what I got out of the, the, the essay, which I found fascinating, the complexity of our world makes it seem like there are causes and effects that arbitrarily either strangle technologies stillborn in their cradles or allow other technologies to take flight. And yet the, the complexities of those systems, the very fact that I'm actually telling history to explain the complexity of a system that he, he did not expose shows that there's so much complexity. When people say, where's your jet pack, there are actually really good reasons why we all don't have jet packs. We could easily have jet packs. But there's a whole bunch of, of systems in place that make jetpacks possibly the not, not the most efficient way of getting around. <laughs> yeah, well, you can you can think of a number of reasons why we, uh, you know, just some really straightforward reasons why it probably wouldn't be a great idea for us to all have jetpacks. I mean, well, I, you know, I'm have sorry. I have, I have teenagers and watching them learn how to drive. I don't want them yeah. with jetpacks. Yeah, cars are bad enough, right. Well, when, when, you, when you describe uh, – when you describe the traffic situation in LA, I can't help but think, well, here's, you know, here's where the self-driving car will take hold, right? It's it's exactly in those kinds of settings where people are, uh, you know, where they've just had it with the the nerve-wracking, horrible experience of uh, of driving. Although although I do want to I do want to back it up a little bit because I think um, the the story you tell absolutely true. What happened to the uh, to the red car? And in fact, the only movie I know that deals with this. Interestingly yeah. enough, is who framed Roger Rabbit, right? Exactly Tell right. The, <laughs> the story of how the how the big business uh, shut down the red car in L.A. Um, I guess everybody else in Hollywood's in on the cartel, right? But uh, you know that that, that one movie it, it, it flips out. <laughs> they, they think it's a spoof or something, but it's actually what happened. Um, but there is something about uh, even if you even if you put all the uh, um, 
financial interests of the of the automobile industry and, and related industries aside, the car took hold in this country. It, you know, it captured the imagination. I don't think that uh, GM was paying F. Scott Fitzgerald right to write the Great Gatsby and have people driving all over the place. You know what I mean? It's like the Jazz Age came along and suddenly there was this new way of being mobile and and into the 30s and into the 40s and into the 50s, the idea just sort of it, it got a hold of people in the way that some later technologies have sort of uh, got. Yeah, I, I think you know we we were just a country of uh, rugged individuals. I mean, uh, um, you know, Walt Whitman style. You know, I mean, that was in our psyche before the car ever came along. And so, places where. Um, you know, uh, public transportation uh, really has worked, like in, like in Europe or in Asia. Uh, you know, Japan, places like that. It, we just, we're, we're just, you know, culturally we're different, and uh, and so um, we we tend to have hung on to our cars. But we well, don't have to go I, that I, far, I got, right? In California, you can say, look at San Francisco, right? Until uh, you know, uh, of course, putting aside. Uh, Everything that uh, everything that PJ just said, but there are differences culturally uh, between between those two places, and there's differences between how people get around there, right? I mean, it, it all it all kind of uh, it all kind of factors in. But I, I agree. But wouldn't you like a maglev? I mean, really, wouldn't you like oh, a maglev yeah. train? Oh yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> uh, that would be awesome. Any of those ideas? I'm a sucker for any of those ideas. You remember the Simpsons episode where they're going to put a monorail in town for no reason <laughs> at all, right? <laughs> I would have, you know, I'd be at the city council meeting. I'd be singing the song too. Yeah, monorail, monorail, because yeah, it's cool. I mean, because monorail. That's why, right? It's just, it's, it's just such an awesome idea. Um, you get, what about us slobs? You'll get cushy jobs. Yeah, I, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> Stephen knows the song. If we didn't yeah. have a rule against singing, Stephen, we. Yeah, we just don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, we don't. We don't sing. Um, but. Uh, but I think I, I think it is one of those technologies that has definitely um, changed the shape of society. You know, oh, it's changed course. the shape of the planet. And you've seen the, the, these satirical pieces. There's an old animated cartoon about um, life on this planet, as told by aliens who are observing us, and they figured out that the cars are actually the living things on this planet, right? And mm-hmm. we're all these like parasites, these subservient creatures that uh, uh, that look after them, you know, and, uh, and do things for them. Um, and you can see where they might get that impression, right? It, to, to the point where the cart is almost uh, is almost driving the horse. And that is a good example of a technology that has really gotten a hold of us and changed us. Whether whether we were, uh, you know, acting out what technology wants, whether we were being used by technology. Or whether it was some kind of simpatico thing, I'm not 100% sure. But yeah. but definitely um, the technology moved in directions that uh, that are different than 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 the direction that uh, that we might have moved otherwise. And I'm wondering, um, can either of you think of other examples of those kinds of technologies that have that have really kind of uh, pushed us along, maybe in unexpected directions? Well, um, I, you know what this reminds me of more than any anything, Phil is. Uh, um, Ray Kurzweil's um, uh, et six epochs of, of evolution uh, that he mentions okay. in his book, uh, The Singularity is Near. And, uh, and, and, you know, we've already had uh, four of these. It's physics and chemistry at the very beginning of the universe. And then biolog- biology and DNA after that. And then information, uh, you know, moved on from, you know, physics and chemistry and biolog- biology and DNA. And then to brains. And now to technology, and uh, and and, uh, and and I think that's really kind of what uh, he's getting at in this TechCrunch article is, you know, um, are we are we uh, the benefactors uh, of this? Are we, you know, do we receive uh, the good stuff of technology? Or are we the servants of it? You know, I mean, which which way does it go? Well, the truth of the matter both, is, though? yeah, we're both. It's it's very um, symbiotic, isn't it? PJ. Exactly. Exactly. And it always has been. It always has been. That that is the nature of technology. All technology is is the externalization and the eventual internalization of tools that make us more than we are. So if that's right. all technology is, from the wheel which allowed us to move farther and faster 
to writing, which allowed us to hold our memory someplace so we didn't have to worry about it and remember everything, to all the way through the Industrial Revolution, Information Age, etc., all we're doing is creating things that make us more likely to solve problems in areas we were too weak to do previously. We couldn't run fast enough, go far enough. We couldn't remember as much. We couldn't, com- you know, our, our computation ability was limited. Whatever it was, that's what technology was there for, to expand ourselves. So, of course, it I guess what technology gets out of us is that we push it along because we like what we're getting from it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and, and that's I, I, and I mean, that's what we always describe as the human imperative, right? It's like this this compounding well, let me, of let me, benefits. That let me uh, kind of add to that the biological imperative, Phil. Um, you know, uh, and which is what? I mean, what does biology want from us? It wants us to create the next generation before we die, right? Yeah. And um, and so you know, well, the, the biology is just using us. Well, you know. Um, but what do we get out of that? We get well, we get sex, which is ain't, which ain't terrible, and um, <laughs> and then you know, and then we get these kids that we love and you know and cherish, and you know, uh, by and large, you know, um, and, um, and and so it's it's not a bad thing, you know. What biology asks from us and what we get out of it is uh, is, is pretty great, and uh, and then you know now technology is uh, you know we have a, a similar relationship with that it seems so. Um, it's it's, uh, it's maybe it's biology a good is using thing. technology. No, Bi- yeah. biology is using te- well. Clearly, biology uses technology because we're using technology right now, and we're biological entities. Right, um, but I'm, I mean, I mean, from the from the self propagating standpoint, even though we do have technologies to stop us from propagating, <laughs> um, <laughs> we we you know these. Well, once again, think about all that goes on in the back seats of cars, right? Just <laughs> Back to cars. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted you. What were you going to yeah, say? You know too much about the history of my life, Phil. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I probably said but, too much. But in a way, says. Phil, you're you're exactly right. So let's again look at some of these, you know, basic technologies. Technology theory is helping us do things more efficiently from levers and pulleys to transportation to information, it's all about doing things more efficiently. What does that leave us time for? Well, technically, it should be making our lives easier, right? Give us more leisure time. Maybe that's what biology wants. Oh, right. Because then, you know, nature takes its course, if you will. One thing leads to another. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you, know, we think, more yeah. those to give us more, yeah. you, you would think the technology would give us more leisure time, too, but uh, it hasn't really worked out that way for, for me in particular. Um, seems like I'm more busy now than I ever was. Well, that, and, well and there you go. I mean, that's, of that's one, of the thing, one of the things we always talk about when we talk about technology, when we talk about the human imperative, is the unintended consequences side of it. So I'm going to stay on... Uh, I'm going to stay on Cantrell's side here just for a moment, and not just because the show still has 30 minutes and we're not allowed to wrap things up quite so uh, <laughs> uh, so pat as that. Um, but also because I think I think there might be something there around um, what we want and what we know we want and what we think we want, um, and technology might amplify one of those for us and send us down a path that we didn't expect to go down. And suddenly we're uh, wanting things we wouldn't necessarily even have wanted or known about or thought about. Um, and we might be uh, moving in directions that uh, are alternatives to things we might have wanted had, had we gone in a different direction technologically, if that, uh, if that makes any sense. Uh, let me give you another, another example of a technology that I think um, definitely delivers on all kinds of needs and wants that we have. So it fits the uh, definition, uh, PJ, that... Uh, that you laid out there, but the, but also that I feel is sort of propelling us along in its on its own trajectory, kind of on its own arc, and it's you know Stephen probably the technology we talk about the most after life extension on this program, which is uh, smartphones, right, and, and social networks probably uh, together are technologies that have delivered us a whole lot of little things that we wanted, 
but have maybe added up to some really big things, good, and some, uh, th- th- that are good, and some really big things that we never would have expected and that maybe aren't as great um, and maybe aren't bad, but just aren't where we would have gone if we hadn't had them, if that, if that, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, I think about this. I don't know if it's an ad for um, Verizon. I'm not sure, but it's the two guys riding around in the car, and they're talking about how big their network is, and it now reaches 93% of the people in the country and 96, 97, something like that. And um, the, the one guy says to the other, and, and that's just awesome because it's this unprecedented opportunity for the world to connect, for people to share. You know, he gives this quick little speech about, you know, why this connectivity is just the best thing ever. And then he turns and he looks at his phone. He's got this big grin on his face. And he turns back to the other guy and he says, my selfie just got 100 likes. A hundred, right? And he's just <laughs> completely thrilled, you know. I mean, the 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 whole the whole business about uh, uh, you know uh, the world being connected and sharing and information all all is completely lost. Um, and, and I was thinking about that in terms of what Cantrell is talking about here. I thought, well, yeah, maybe technology is kind of flattering us along here in uh, in in directions that uh, that that we might not have gone. Now, I think. Um, the answer to that probably is that, well, we still want new things, and, uh, you know, we want better versions of the technology that we have, and we want more meaningful relationships in our lives, and we want, you know, all this stuff that we want, and so we'll continue working with it, and there will be more intended consequences and more unintended consequences, but uh, but along the way, we end up, uh, we end up maybe uh, experiencing some things we wouldn't have experienced had uh, we not built those machines in the first place. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> I haven't left as much place to go with that, Bill. No, well, well, not I, just experience. I, I, I said that wrong. Um, we end up moving in directions we wouldn't have moved in, right? Um, I, I think that when um, it, it's kind of the unanticipatable, if that's a word, nature of how these things get implemented. You know, when when Facebook was first introduced, um, the idea that you might spend six hours a day on it didn't exist, right? I mean, you didn't know that uh, that, that there would be that much time. The idea that you could get that emotionally revved up about uh, how many likes you've gotten on <laughs> your selfie, which is just, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the ultimate expression of, I don't know, narcissism or whatever, um, uh, that trend wasn't necessarily understood. We didn't say, hey, go give us a technology that will let us spend six hours a day on Farmville. Um, go, you know, what I really need is uh, a way that I can find out what my aunt had for dinner last night or, you know, wh- whatever it is. Uh, those things all came as a consequence, um, and we end up valuing some of it and liking some of it and interacting with some of it, but we didn't plan on it. And um, what we'll be doing with technology even – next week or next year or 10 years from now will probably be a similar sort of mixed bag of what we thought we wanted and kind of what we what we ended up doing. But don't discount. <laughs> don't discount the fact that many companies actually know what they would like you to get out of it. Facebook knows very well the psychology of novelty and why we're compelled to keep looking back at either the self-validation of the likes Mm -hmm. or the novelty of new information, new information, new information. They're incredibly aware of that. None of that is is accidental. It may be accidental to us, but it's not to their makers. Right, Um, right. And, and, and so what y'all are kind of describing is a uh, is a top down where you know uh, whether it be Facebook or maybe a casino that's setting up their casino in such a way that you know you just when you want to go and and gamble in their ca- casino because the way they've got it set up they understand psychology too. Um, exactly. It's also, oh, yeah. there's a, it also can occur organically. Um, you know, meme theory. Memes don't care about their hosts. Um, and not, you know, not naturally. I mean, you can. Ha- there are memes that, 
you know, uh, you can have an ideology that uh, leads to suicide, uh, to, to attacking others, to violence. There are also memes that are the, are you know, that lead to great things. You know, I, ideas that sort of, you know, um, pass from host to host and and are a good thing. Uh, but they're really, uh, you know, you know, a, a meme in the, in, the, in this way of looking at ideas. Uh, they really, they don't really care about their hosts so much. Uh, it's just uh, the only thing they care about is replication, right? Um, if you know, if you can anthropomorph- anthropomorphize them that much, it's uh, just being passed on. And if uh, and if for whatever reason an idea doesn't get replicated, then it's just forgotten and um, and and is replaced by others. So. But what's interesting about that, Stephen, is just to swing it back to what you said earlier about biology, there's got to be something in it for us or we wouldn't be doing it, right? But right. You know, from the meme standpoint, they don't care if uh, if we're happy or miserable or kill ourselves or whatever. But that has got to be meeting some very deep need for people when a meme gets a hold of them, right, and, and they become the, uh, the the replicators of it, whatever that is. Uh, th- there's something well, I, you know a suicide bomber is uh, has has certain psychological needs that are being met when they become a suicide bomber um and uh you know i guess uh, <laughs> as, as a world we got to figure out ways to uh, you know uh to head that off i guess um you know uh, but so far we haven't been all that successful at it have we i well we i really don't think we're very good at either Starting them or stopping them. Um, I, I, although uh, PJ, I take your point that um, that the people behind these technologies are very aware of what seems to stick. Once they figured out that something sticks, they can replicate the ones that stick. But I don't think they invent them. You, you know what I mean? It, they, they, they still seem to just sort of um, pop up almost almost spontaneously. It's almost like you need a large group of people. Um, interacting with each other to start uh, to start having memes emerge, um, and and then and then yeah they they are kind of driving us along in in, in much the same way that our uh, that our biological that our biological urges do. That's that's, uh, that's and, very and interesting. I, I think it's almost more luck than by design because why, why do these huge companies like Facebook and Google and others why do they feel the need to buy little companies? <laughs> because they see what you know. Oh, this little company has this idea that we never came up with. With all our geniuses that w- working inside of our company, we s- somehow managed to miss this. These guys got lucky, and it's taking off. Let's get them before they get too big, and uh, so we can bring that uh, bring those ideas in house. So by by purchasing that company, so I think a lot of it's just luck. You know what? And you know we try different things, and some things work, some things don't. And then then the Googles of the world. Yeah, you know, eat, eat eat them up, you know. Um, yeah, well, th- th- they're very good at uh, at giving us m- kind of amplifying what works, right? In the right. same way that I think technology sort of amplifies uh, amplifies what we want. Okay, so uh, let's let's spread this let's spread this topic out a little bit. We've got we've got some other big questions about technology that we can ask. And, and another one that I wanted to get to was my my friend Eric Cavanaugh has written this piece over on LinkedIn that I thought was quite interesting called Rise of the Machines, We Should Be So Lucky. And he talks about, in a sense, trying to dispel a lot of fear people have about technologies, talking about how it's not going to wipe us out, um, talking about how it's not going to take our jobs away, but how really um, we're that much better off whenever a technological solution comes into play for a number of reasons, but one of which that he points out is that uh, machines don't lie. Uh, which is an an interesting stance that he takes there. Um, But basically you can rely on them in a way that you can't necessarily rely on, um, rely on people. And I I think it's ultimately (laughs) a very optimistic. How can you say uh, that they won't take our jobs? (laughs) It's just a question I've got. (laughs) If you can rely on them in a way you can't rely on people, it seems to me that then they're going to take our jobs. (laughs) Well, um, if you, you, well, that's a, that's a good point. I, I, the other one of the other points that Eric makes is that they they at least now only do what we tell them to do, right? So they'll only take our jobs if ultimately collectively we tell them to take our jobs, right? I mean that is, is kind of uh, is is kind of what it comes down to that we, that we don't need to be afraid of what we've created 
um, and that we don't need to fear it um, getting out of control, that in fact we should value it because of you know, its potential integrity um, and its potential ability to do better by us, uh, for us to do better by, you know, for ourselves than, than we could by ourselves with, with technology. But, uh, what's your take on that, PJ? What do you think? Uh, is, uh, is Eric Kavanaugh on the right track? I think he's delightfully naive. Okay. <laughs> Agreed. Um, Agreed. Say again? I agree completely, PJ. Um, but go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, it's okay. Um, I think that by again, and this comes back sort of full circle to what we were discussing at the very beginning, by separating out machine technology from the people who use machine technology, he's creating a dichotomy where none really exists. I mean, this if you were talking about artificial superintelligence or artificial general intelligence versus humanity. That's another conversation and one I'd love to have. Uh, I don't know if you guys read uh, the article George Dvorsky wrote uh, interviewing David Bren. Very interesting. We'll co- come back to that in a moment. But to Kavanaugh's article, I think the fact that he's separating the two is a, a, a false dichotomy. It's meaningless. We yeah. are the people who have have become machines in essence. The machines are just an extension of us. So the fact that we can, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated that he sees machines in this light like they have their own little country and their own little, you know, part of the world and we can go pet them and I, I don't even understand it. Well, uh, let, let me be. Let me uh, be my, my computer lied to me earlier today. It it, uh, it sent me a uh, email message from someone claiming to be a Nigerian prince. It just you know, it <laughs> well, lies. Exactly. It, it lies I, I all the time. I, let, let me let, let, let me be fair to Eric because uh, okay. uh, I, I think he he makes exactly that point that that um, if if the bad stuff happens for him it's it's actually it's actually people he he talks about the idea of machines taking over rubbing us out he says frankly such a pop proposition is just about as absurd as blaming tiny building blocks of life for all the world's troubles remember co2 is what plants inhale such that they may exhale oxygen which is what we humans breathe in every day machines won't be the problem computers will not destroy the world and they won't take away our jobs etc cetera, etc cetera. i i think his point is that if these things happen you look to humanity driving that uh, you look but they're also things. an amplifier, as as we said before. They are yeah. an amplifier. It makes it a lot easier oh. to do something a lot worse. Yes. Uh, we do, but here, here's another thing um, and uh, that I think Eric is missing. What is best for us as individuals is often not what we as um, corporally end up doing, Okay. When we're when we're uh, when we as you know mankind working together do things, um, it, it may not be the we may not be providing the best future for individuals um, uh, corporately as you know you know as that what we would want. So okay, so maybe the best the best possible future would be something you know uh, where you know we reach a equilibrium with our technology and. We don't, you know, and we don't go any further than a certain point, you know, with with our technology. Does anyone really believe that we're going to stop before we, uh, once we reach an equilibrium, uh, uh, or that we will reach an equilibrium? Absolutely not. We're going to keep pushing it um, and until we do lose our jobs. And that may not be the best thing for the poor guy that, you know, is not equipped to uh, to move from um, a hamburger flipper uh, to hamburger flipper machine technician. You know, um, it's um, and and so we end up doing. Th- you know, we end up uh, uh, you know with a very different society, a very um, and, and you know one which we may or may not be ready for. And you know, uh, it's a little bit different from the optimistic take that we we've, we've always had, Phil. But I think it's something we need to kind of face. Well, I, I, you know, I, and thus the. Uh the twenty percent of the time we spend on our Pareto analysis, right, talking about the uh, right. uh, the, 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 the the potential uh, bleak uh, or you know horrible futures that that can occur, and, and definitely um, all of these possibilities fall into 
um, fall into that space. I, you know, I, I think that um, there's there's something to be said for not immediately falling into the um, – there's a possibility that this bad thing can happen, therefore it will, um, which obviously n- nobody, uh, nobody in this show does that. Um, but uh, w- one of the other – one of the other pieces I was linking to to, to talk about um, tonight was actually this, this discussion about whether artificial intelligence is going to wipe us out. It's a really interesting discussion going on that on Facebook, and I couldn't find the page to share it with anyone. But uh, uh, but one of the points that kept getting rehashed by people commenting on the piece because it's an interesting discussion. You know, is is artificial intelligence going to replace us? Is it going to just flat out wipe us out? Two slightly different questions. Um, but uh, coming from a lot of the same, you know, extrapolations on a lot of the same things, Stephen, that, that you're just that, that you're talking about there, um, that, that ultimately, you, you know, you reach a point that it pushes us in a direction that we didn't expect. Kind of going back to what I was talking about um, at the beginning, and then starts making decisions for itself, and, and maybe decides that, uh, that that we don't even necessarily need to be here. Um, anyway, one, one of the themes that kept recurring in the comments was. Well, uh, you know, maybe to save the planet, uh, that would be the best thing um, <laughs> to wipe us out. Uh, I, 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 saw, I saw a number of, um, of, of threads to that effect, you know, kind of taking the side of the AI that, to, that, that, that decides to wipe out all of humanity um, with the sort of, uh, you know, cynical, um, wearier of the world than thou attitude that, um, you know, we're kind of a net – deficit on the planet anyhow therefore uh there, therefore we should go i think if anything um if technology starts making those kinds of decisions um i think it's likely to like us a lot better than that you know that uh that if if we get to the point where technology is deciding our fate yeah there's horrible possible scenarios where it's going to say well they're a pestilence or they're completely irrelevant to us and and they have to go um with as much of us as we're putting into the technology going into the technology um and as kind of you know to use the term i used earlier flattering to us as it's been up to this point i can't help but think that chances are technology is going to have kind of a you know soft spot for us ultimately um what do you guys think? Are, you know, are, are we getting all worked up about nothing? Is, is technology more likely to like us or, or dislike us? Well, I, I'd love to come back to this idea that David Brin's been discussing with George Dvorsky, which is the the notion that fearing superintelligence is ignoring the fact that we go through a process with technology. Mm-hmm. And if we listen to the naysayers, if we look at the dystopic science fiction, if we go, wow, this could all go horribly wrong, it actually presents an opportunity to step back, look at the first principles and say, hmm, what could we do to prevent this? He uses an example called the Asilomar process when the biology community got together to create a suite of procedures and best practices for genetic engineering led to a moratorium. Uh, they wanted to create a win-win so that genetic engineering could go for- forward with safety and care. Mm. And he said, we've done this many times where, be it atomic energy, be it whatever the big bad thing we thought could run away with itself and that Michael Crichton probably wrote a technophobic thriller about – um, we sat down, looked at it, threw ideas back and forth, and came up with some strategy that made it more likely we would survive that scenario. And so his feeling of, you know, where where these, well, maybe humanity should be wiped out, or maybe, you know, <laughs> well, don't worry about it, we'll be able to control it. His attitude is, don't worry so much about the end. Worry about the process. Where are we now? How can we get to a win-win scenario eventually and concentrate on the process? And I think that's the thing that a lot of these debates miss. Everybody goes 
to the end point of the scenario. And they don't think about how did they get there. Right, right. Uh, and and, and um, you look at – oh, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I, I just uh, – I, I wanted to – first say I, I agree completely. I think uh, the, the moral of, of the story, PJ, you're telling is, uh, you know, Watch more sci-fi. Read more sci-fi novels. I think that's, <laughs> and, I, and I love that. Yes, I, I like I, that I, idea. Uh, yeah, it, you're playing right into my wheelhouse, I promise. I, you know, <laughs> you're preaching to the choir here. Um, but I, I would I would say uh, also, uh, Phil, uh, in, in answer to your question, you know, you know, will uh, AIs love us or hate us or, or you know, uh, as, there are there are plenty of stories, particularly by um, Isaac Asimov, uh, that where the technology loved us and created a dystopian place in order to protect us. You know, you know, mm-hmm. you know, mankind mankind can't be trusted with their own freedom because they they will hurt each other. They uh, so they need to you know we need to we need to rule over them. Um, it's you know and you end up you end up with a dystopic future there as well. So I, I guess <laughs> it's. We, you know, we got uh, we got to watch that also. I guess uh, we, we, um, you know, careful not to uh, to have a to have AI that does that either. Um, but yeah, wa- but yes, watch more sci-fi. <laughs> well, uh, you know, read, even read in, in, in those scenarios, you know what I what I would say is, well, uh, okay, at least they appreciate us, right? It's like these <laughs> these AIs that come along and just wipe us out because we're like a pestilence. It's like, geez, where's the gratitude? You know, it's like after we after we built you, you know. I I just feel that that's uh, you know, there, there's something just you know half sharper than a serpent's tooth, right? And uh, <laughs> then then be wiped out by the very the very technology that uh, that you that you went to all that trouble creating. But I think that obviously. Um, David Brin is is on the right track there. That that, that w- when you think about it, um, even before we had really formal systems built around this, it is a built-in or uh, perhaps you know developed very painfully uh, attribute of human societies of human behavior. That once we figure out that something is dangerous, we go, gosh, we got to be careful with this, or it'll kill us. Right? I mean, we we have mastered fire for millions of years, I don't know, a long time, and we've never burned the whole planet down, right? I mean, there, there, there is a far end of this thing will be the end of us to, to every technology, to, uh, if, if not every technology, to many of the technologies that we use. And, you know, we become aware of that downside, and we start putting actions in place to, to curb that downside. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, exactly what, uh, what you're saying, PJ. It's a process. That, uh, that we have always followed and that uh, we're likely to continue to follow. Now, one of the tricky, scary things about artificial intelligence, obviously, in these, these singularity models, the hard t- takeoff singularity models, is that it just all happens so fast, right? And we don't have the chance to put those, uh, those controls in place uh, th- that, that we once might have. But, but failing that, um, I, you know, I don't see why we get dumber, Right. I, I don't see why we become less interested in preserving ourselves in the future or, or even in the present than, than we've always been. You know, for, for AI to wipe us out, ultimately that's us wiping ourselves out by way of our, you know, allowing ourselves to, to build the AI that, uh, that will do it. And, yeah, I, I think ultimately, you know, we're, we're going to be too smart to do that. And, well, one, uh, one thing he also says is uh, we might – well, being too smart, <laughs> I don't know if I give us that much credit, but his big concern is that there, of course, him being David, that there be transparency, that the greatest danger is for technologies to be developed where there isn't the checks and balances of people coming in from the outside and saying, hey, not such a great idea, do you think about this? Right. When they're done in secret and they're done in a vacuum, that's the biggest danger. And, of right. course, we yep. have lots of stories of science fiction endeavors, be they Terminator, et cetera, where things were done in secret. It would have been obvious to the viewer what the problem was. Right. Well, that's true, though. Uh, you know, the, the, no, the, the, don't do that. Yeah, the, the more widely the idea is dispersed, the more likely it is to be 
criticized, whether fairly or unfairly, exactly. the more likely you are to have other perspectives on it and for those controls to be put in place. Because, yeah, because a, a smaller group or an individual can get really married to an idea that's not a great idea, you know, that, that has a downside that, uh, that, that that really keeps it from being something that uh, uh, that, that we should be pursuing. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's... Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. That's that's a that's a great antidote. I have not actually read that uh, interview, so I'm going to have to go back and read that because I think that, uh, as he so often is, David Brin is uh, is right on the right track there. But I will say, I think we are that smart. I think we don't give ourselves enough credit. I think when when we describe ourselves as a pestilence that should be wiped off the planet, that we you know we we spite our we, we cut up our noses despite our face. We throw the baby out with the bathwater. I, I, I feel that uh, saving planet Earth without saving humanity is a questionable proposition at best. I think we're we're a valuable part of uh, of, of what this thing is, and uh, I, I have a pretty high opinion of us. Even though I grant you that uh, sometimes we uh, we make it challenging to maintain a high opinion of us. So, with that, gosh, can you believe it? I told you this would happen. Um, we're actually just about out of time. Any parting thoughts on this subject from either of you two? PJ, you got anything? <laughs> uh, go transparency and large group discussion. Yay. I like it. A- absolutely. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, every now and then uh, listen to the people that uh, you think are crazy and uh, are, are just absolutely nuts and are, are, are on the opposite side of whatever, you know, uh, whatever argument you are, you are arguing. I think uh, we can, we learn a lot more from our detractors than we do from those who are telling us how awesome we are. Yeah. You, you might learn something or they might be about to do something really scary and you might stop them. So either way, it's probably yeah. a good idea. To- either way, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> listen to listen to people who are crazy. PJ, thank you so much for being with us. It's great having you back on again. Let's uh let's do it again soon. Uh great news on the book and we look forward to hearing more about that. Thanks so much guys. It's always a pleasure. All right, Stephen, before I ask about our music, I want to do two things real fast. First, a quick shout out to our good buddy Wayne Rodinsky who has been kind enough to send me a link to the uh monorail scene from the Simpsons. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I'm going to watch that right <laughs> after this uh right after this show ends. And I also want to remind everyone that we've got a very special show again next week. We're going to be talking with Keith Wiley about his book, A Taxonomy and Metaphysics of Mind Uploading. And if that sounds like a really deep philosophical discussion, it absolutely is. But it's also a load of fun, and we want you all to be with us next week. Okay, Stephen, what's our music? Our music tonight is War Against Innovation by Aswell. As will with War Against Innovation. Thanks so much for putting that together. Stephen, thanks again to PJ for being with us, and thank you all for being with us on The World Transformed. As I said, we'll be back again at the usual time next week with a very special show. And until next time, live to see it. We're very capable, but your head is full of so many ideas. And I tried somehow, it made an awkward sound.
Support for this podcast comes from the Utah Office of Tourism, announcing the Four Corners School of Outdoor Education. Located at 7,100 feet near the base of the Abajo Mountains in Monticello, Utah, the school's Canyon Country Discovery Center campus is an ideal location for your next tour or vacation. They invite you to visit and learn about Utah's unique canyon country through day trips or week-long adventures. More at fourcornerschool.org. Support for this podcast comes from the Utah Office of Tourism, announcing the Four Corners School of Outdoor Education. Located at 7,100 feet near the base of the Abajo Mountains in Monticello, Utah, the school's Canyon Country Discovery Center campus is an ideal location for your next tour or vacation. They invite you to visit and learn about Utah's unique canyon country through day trips or week-long adventures. More at fourcornerschool.org.